Chapter 2 How have you been feeling? Bethany tossed the question over in her mind before replying. She gave an involuntary shiver. Confused. Why is that? She struggled to explain. Things have been more in focus, more intense. It has been difficult to deal with all these new feelings that I have not experienced before. Bethany? Dr. Holly Urshman looked at her in sympathy. We can assume that before the trauma you experienced as a child, that you had these emotions before. They were just dimmed from the regime of medication you were on. Now that we are focusing your medications on strengthening your memory, your emotions will return to what is normal. Shall we discuss some coping strategies? Please, nodded Bethany. She realized she was pulling on her purse strap, fraying the leather. This was another habit Bethany picked up since changing her doctor and her medications. Fidgeting was new. Bethany was not sure she was comfortable with the new her, especially since the new her was destroying a Gucci bag. Sometimes it was overwhelming. All these emotions and reactions that she could not recall ever having experienced before. There were times when she wished for the numbness induced by her previous psychiatrist. However, Bethany wanted answers more. How have the nightmares been? inquired Holly. Frustrating, sighed Bethany. They are always the same. I cannot seem to see any further to remember what happened. Let's go over it again. Holly jotted something down on her notepad. Bethany took a deep breath. I am in a tiny bathroom. It is old because everything is almond colored. The tiny tub, the toilet. There is water in the tub. He has his big hand on my face and he, he keeps pushing me under the water. Holly waited patiently as Bethany trembled at the memory of her nightmare. He keeps saying that I never saw anything, heard anything, that I was never there. I'm choking on the water, and I cannot get away because he's so much bigger than me. Bethany frowned angrily. I know who it is. I know his voice. It is so familiar. I just cannot place it. Anything else? No. She shook her head regretfully. I just wake up choking each time. Holly assessed Bethany with a look. Have you thought more about our discussion of trying to trigger the memory? Bethany clenched her hands so hard her manicured nails were biting into her skin. She gave a sharp nod. I'm going to do it. Are you certain? gently asked Holly. Yes, I need to know, Bethany said stoutly. She ignored the frisson of terror that danced down her spine. Then I will set it up, Holly smiled. I'm glad you are going to take this route in your treatment. Sometimes it is important to confront our fears. Bethany nodded with some trepidation. They discussed a few minor details, then the time was up for the session. Holly scheduled Bethany in again for her normal time and promised to get in contact with her when she'd get a slot in at the local pool. Bethany agreed even as her stomach rebelled against the idea. She debated purchasing a new purse but decided against it. There was no point in destroying another handbag. Maybe, if she could manage to get her emotions under control, to find out the mystery of her past, she would be able to stop fidgeting. Bethany certainly hoped so. Since there was some time to spend, Bethany chose to walk to the downtown dance studio where she volunteered to teach inner-city kids ballet. She enjoyed the discipline and exercise ballet gave her. For a long time, that was all she enjoyed out of it. Now, Bethany was starting to love dance as an art form. That was a new development since she had changed psychiatrists and medications. Bethany wondered if she might be able to go professional if she had changed things when she was very young. Her teachers had always said she had a natural talent, but was far too prone to keep everything very technical. Bethany could give a flawless performance, but there was no warmth to it, no emotion, nothing that engaged the audience. She had been passed over multiple times for that particular flaw. This was something that also haunted her musical career. The orchestra depended on her for her accuracy, but it was true she gave no emotion, no art to the performance. Her notes were played flawlessly with the violin, but there was always something missing. The orchestra paid a pittance per year to employ her talent. Now that she was finally experiencing emotions, they felt overexposed, raw and aching. Her music had become a refuge and painful at the same time. Bethany could now put art into the music, but sometimes it carried her away and she had a hard time continuing. If this kept up and she could not get her emotions under control, Bethany might lose her place in the orchestra. 
Thankfully, she could live off the income her father gave her. Otherwise, her condo, spending money, medical treatments, and lifestyle would be all impossible. She still wanted to keep her job. It gave meaning to her life, being able to share her talent and help others enjoy music. Reaching the studio, she let herself in and watched a small class doing a modern dance routine. Sometimes, Bethany wondered if she should mix modern dance into the ballet that she taught her students, but Bethany had been classically trained. She did not know how to dance in the modern style. Jazz, hip-hop, and whatever the latest trends were beyond her, she would stick to her ballet. None of her students would ever become professional dancers. These were inner-city kids who did not have enough money nor opportunity to seriously learn the dance. The majority would not even make it to Bethany's en point class. The girls' families simply could not afford the shoes, and most would not take the charity of Bethany providing the footwear for their child. Still, she enjoyed teaching the classes. Bethany hoped that it added structure and self-confidence to the girls, two qualities that they desperately needed in life. Confidence was something she had always struggled with for herself. Bethany knew that she was considered beautiful. She had a long, lean dancer's body with blonde hair and blue eyes. Far from it being a boon, she found it to be an irritant at times. Women did not tend to want to be her friend. Men wanted far too much of her. Until they found out that she was different. She'd always been different. Bethany could not remember her childhood. Something as simple as remembering a birthday gift before the age of ten was beyond her. She had night terrors as a child. They were so bad that her parents had her start a regime of antidepressants, sedatives, and therapy. As a result, Bethany had always felt zoned out. She had a difficulty in formulating lasting relationships. She had not felt the same range of emotions as other people did. Thus, Bethany had never really known hate or love. Life was bland. She allowed her parents far too much influence in her life. That was why Bethany had finally decided to leave her former psychiatrist and try something new. She went to Dr. Ershman and had immediately liked her. It was sad when her psychiatrist was the closest thing to a friend that she had. Bethany wanted to understand why she was having the nightmares, always the same one. She wanted to understand why her parents thought she was mentally fragile, why they were so reluctant to start therapy with a new doctor. Ted and Constance Searson had voiced their concerns constantly over her mental health all her life. Bethany was tired of it. She wanted to be normal. At Dr. Ershman's suggestion, they were going to confront her biggest fear and try to push her mind to remember why she was so afraid of water. Dr. Ershman thought she was strong enough, capable of steering her own destiny. The thought gave her courage. Bethany smiled as she went through the practice routines with her pupils. They were her joy. Funny, smart, enthusiastic, and talented, each in their own way. They're happy and normal kids, enjoying a couple hours away from the world. She was pleased that she got to share that experience with them twice a week. Finally, class was over, and Bethany sent all of them on their way. She had a small dinner, changed, and went to the practice at the orchestra hall with her co-workers. Bethany played the violin. She could also play other instruments, but this was her professional position with the orchestra. Bethany. Reginald Wells gave her a smile. How are you today? Fine, thank you, replied Bethany. Good manners had her asking, and you, Reggie? Very well. He smiled a little wider, revealing his wisdom teeth. Reggie was able to display all his teeth when he pulled his lips back far enough. It was a little disconcerting. Perhaps if he gained some weight, he would not be able to give such skeletal grins. It was almost as disconcerting as all the attention he was paying her lately. Bethany managed a polite smile in return and fiddled with her sheet music. Hopefully, he would see that she was busy and leave her alone. I heard that John Hopper has the flu, Reggie leaned over, whispering. His bow nearly poked Bethany in the face. That means that Solo might be available for Thursday's performance. That is too bad about John, Bethany murmured. It seemed like the polite thing to say. Are you thinking about applying? asked Reggie. Bethany looked at him in surprise. For the solo? You're talented enough, Reggie complimented her. You would look lovely up there in front of the audience. I'm sure you would be chosen if you would apply. That is nice of you to say, responded Bethany. I had not thought about it. Are you going to apply? Oh, me? Reggie flushed with delight that she would even think that he should. 
I'm not as beautiful as you. I wouldn't look as nice up front. Bethany was not sure what she should say to that. She hoped John would get well very soon, so it would not even be an issue. Say, Bethany, Reggie leaned a little closer, what are you doing this Friday? We could have dinner. Bethany tried not to lean further away from him. If she did, she might fall off her chair. Reggie had no idea of personal space. I'm sorry, Reggie, I've made plans. Really? What about Saturday? He was persistent as always. Bethany took a deep breath as she remembered what she and Dr. Ershman had talked about. She needed to set boundaries in her life, for her parents and for Reggie. Reggie, you and I are good friends. Sure, Reggie grinned his toothy smile. Bethany nodded. I would not want to jeopardize that friendship by becoming further involved. Reggie frowned and smiled as a thought occurred to him. He adjusted his glasses. I've always thought that friendship was a firm foundation for the beginning of a relationship. That did make sense. However, Bethany did not want to build a relationship with him. Reggie was not the sort of man she longed for. Bethany did not know if she would ever meet the sort of man that she hoped to spend her life with, but it certainly was not this odd fellow beside her. The conductor entered the room, and the entire orchestra stood up in deference to him. Reggie leaned over again. What do you say about Saturday? Bethany looked down at Reggie. He stood a full five inches shorter than her. I'm very sorry, Reggie. I have neglected to mention that I'm seeing someone. Really? Reggie looked at her with disappointment. Who? You don't know him, Bethany said a little desperately as they took their seats again. She was a poor liar. Oh, please, not like that Ramsley guy, groused Reggie, asking you to marry him and dumping you for another woman just like that. Noah was in love with Elle, responded Bethany. I was pleased they were able to be together. She had been happy for the couple. They were wonderful together and had a love that she envied. Bethany wanted someone to love her the way that Noah loved his wife. It was deplorable, insisted Reggie. You are beautiful, talented, amazing. How anyone could let you go is beyond me. If I had you, I would treat you like a queen. It would be so convenient if only Reggie was someone she could like in return. Bethany bemoaned the fact that he was just not attractive, had annoying habits like neglecting to respect personal space boundaries, and was a cloying little man. Thank you, politely said Bethany. This was her problem. She read far too many romance books and wanted someone to walk off a cover to love her. Real life simply did not work that way. Who is he? Reggie asked, leaning in, almost taking out her eye with his bow. His violin wavered alarmingly off balance on his knee. Bethany tried not to jerk away, but carefully removed the bow back with a hand. Her mind drew a blank. Just someone I recently met. Then it's not a serious relationship. Reggie sighed in relief. What is he like? Do I know him? He is different. I like him very much. Bethany tried to think. You would not know him as he does not run in our circles. Considering he was entirely fictional, he certainly did not belong in their social world. Reggie looked like he was going to say something when the conductor tapped his music stand to get everyone's attention. Thank goodness, Bethany thought fervently. She had no idea how to answer Reggie's questions. If he had kept it up, Bethany might have started talking about her latest romance character that she was reading. Bethany was pretty certain there was no way she could be dating a Highland soldier from the 15th century. However, no one else was coming to mind to use as a template. She really needed to get out more often. The orchestra went through scales, practiced certain pieces, and a person was picked to be the second in case John was too under the weather to perform his solo on Thursday. Bethany was glad that they had not chosen her. Now she would not have to endure Reggie's congratulations. As it was, she quickly packed up her music and violin, hoping to get away from him before he began to ask more questions. Maybe we could have a double date sometime, persisted Reggie. Maybe. Bethany tried to be noncommittal. I will have to see what he says. He was not going to say anything. He was not real. Bethany thought that maybe she should feel bad about misleading Reggie. However, he shot her another toothy grin as he left, and she remained behind, hoping to avoid having to talk to Reggie further. 
Bethany was going to have to find someone to date. She could not keep lying to him. It was not nice, and she was bound to get caught. She wondered if her mother had anyone in mind. Constant was always trying to set Bethany up with someone. Not that she was ever successful. The closest she had come was Noah Ramsley. Noah had been a good friend. If a relationship could have continued on friendship, Bethany felt that she might have been happy with Noah. Not mind-blowingly in love like the romance novels, but content. They had gotten along, and he was very accommodating to her. Noah and Bethany had dated, tried out new things, and generally had a good time. However, he had been in love with someone else. Most of the time, Bethany was very happy for him. Sometimes she felt a twinge of disappointment that no one loved her the way that Noah loved Elle. Maybe she would not call her mother to ask her to set her up. Bethany could always keep up the fiction, and when Reggie became too close, she could just break up with Mr. Did Not Exist. What a sad thought. However, in the meanwhile, he would be Bethany's dream guy. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for Chapter 3 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series. Also hit that like button. This helps with the algorithms and is completely free to you and very helpful to my channel. Thank you and happy reading!